now we are moving ahead for the next session so which is elastic search we have here with dhananjay sorry sorry hello welcome sir <laughs> he is a python developer and design and build intelligent and slick software suit at direct type he is going to speak about elastic search and how he leverages this awesomeness in their massive infrastructure i hand over the podium to him uh hello everybody uh yeah that's a large crowd so anyway thank you so good afternoon all of you uh today i'll be talking about elastic search uh so the idea of this talk is to get you acquainted with elastic search which i'm really not an expert on but i've been using for the last one and a half years uh at my job at directi uh i'm responsible for designing and building the central operations platform and uh we leverage elastic search in multiple ways right so let's uh i know when we start introducing a new database Uh, the first question or we kind of end up in the slugfest over what my database is better than yours or you know i use mongo i use sql or whatever i do okay guys can we please settle down first uh let's settle down before we uh, so that we can start fast So the first questions that uh, fanboys are going to put out there is uh, can it do x or y and z is it open source is it scalable is it redundant uh, does it support hadoop and analytics it's rest well i just thought i'd put that out of the way and say yes it does most of those things it comes with hadoop connectors it's based on uh, lucene which is quite brilliant in its design and the way it's actually built and powers everything from s- simple search applications uh, to uh, the blue gene that played jeopardy uh, ibm's blue gene right so it's incredibly powerful and it comes with a large uh, large subset of functions but they are slightly hard to use and understand and elastic search kind of builds around that the second question you're going to ask is uh is it ready for production use uh is it web scale and blah blah right so uh for a project that came around in feb 2010 and released the 1.0 release this uh as recently as feb 2014 it is uh incredibly stable it is used in production uh wikipedia's search is now powered by elastic search they moved over from solar uh before graph search came to facebook uh it's also powered by elastic search github's code search is powered by elastic search add direct i uh, on large bunch of teams use elastic search in uh, different ways um uh, come to the next point uh you need to understand something very fundamental right when you're using a no sql data store you have to use it for what it's designed to do you can't use a cannon to kill a fly right so what is it good for obviously um since it's called elastic search well full text queries The second thing is geo queries, right? If you wanted to find an aggregate metric of how many people here uh, like Thai food or uh, play uh, are talking about Angry Birds on Twitter, and box that by geo grids, that's incredibly hard to do in your usual database. So that is incredibly simple here. Uh, big data, right? Elasticsearch is not asset compliant and it does not support transactions, right? So obviously you cannot use it for something like a banking transaction. but then you could use it for really large amounts of logs and datas uh, structures and stuff like that it's incredible for aggregations it's good for scripting percolation and uh, well i'll these three points i'll cover in more detail time series data is probably the most used uh, form of elastic search where you pair it with the elk stack and you uh, put all your logs into kibana and logstash and elastic search powers that 
and um, they have a special section on auto completions which i will uh, show you right so when you're dealing with large clusters of uh, distributed databases ideally it's a pain to set up you know even setting up sql replication is not really the easiest things of, to do if you're setting up something else you probably want to set up something like zookeeper to synchronize your nodes in elasticsearch the four commands you see is all you need to do you can automate it using whatever automation tool you like and you run the fourth command multiple number of times and they'll discover themselves in that cluster and you have a really large cluster coming up hit any one of those nodes on port 9200 and you're dealing with the rest api it's completely based off rest for any language but java in java if you're using the clients you can talk over their custom wire protocol so if you want to handle really really large loads i would advise you to use java but if you're using python or if you're using uh, ruby or whatever else in fact even if you're using javascript in your browser you can talk to your database using json and rest right so it's important to understand this mapping now uh, the way we have been brought up and the way we started programming we came up with you know we understand sql constructs really well and we try and map those when we start developing applications for a nosql case right so indice it has a concept of indices which can be uh, analogous to your databases in sql it has types okay now types are pretty interesting types would be like your definition of a table and a table would look something like uh, this part over here right and uh, it would give it structure it would give it form you could decide in settings you could decide how many shards how many replicas do you want what is the purge rate a lot of things that you probably don't want to know and mapping would be where you describe what your json is about if this field comes how do i map it to a certain data type now it's really interesting because elasticsearch by design is schemaless so the first time you pump in a json that says like the json over here if i pump this in so you can clearly see info is already a nested document and interest is an array type over here so the first time you pumped in a document with uh, these fields he would automatically initialize it to us uh, to an email type to a string type and you know do an integer type um, this can cause problems because at times when you input float data uh, the mappings are not valid any longer and you can't actually do math on them and a lot of the use case of Elasticsearch is to do a lot of calculations right so a document looks like this which can be analogous to your SQL record and the, the advantages are pretty apparent right in, in SQL you would have a record and you would have a foreign key in another table essentially the developer has to flatten out his data structure right and that is not necessarily the best of practices you end up with those crazy uh, outer joins and inner joins and stuff like that which is honestly a pain at times right so what is full text search how how does uh, this database work internally and understanding this is pretty key if i had a bunch of documents what i would do is if i were to invert the search on its head right and if i wanted to know what documents contain football and what documents contain job what you would do is then you would you could iterate through every document and look for the word football or job but clearly that won't scale that that'll be too time consuming so what you do is take the data that you have from here you analyze it split it up get each word and now each field right each field like you remember you had name and email name would now become a hash map where you would say uh, niners is a key and the values are now the documents it belongs to so if i search for niners or if i search for buildings he'll tell me it belongs to document three right so well that solves the problem of a single word now what about a phrase if i wanted to know about football job for instance right i'm looking to coach a team how do i do that so what i do is just make a small modification and i store the document and the location as a tuple right now i i know football belongs to document a at index 2 and document b at index 3 now i look for job with the same analyzer and i find in document a it's at index 10 so clearly it does not need football job but in document b it's at index 3 which is an offset of 1 which was exactly what your query was so turn it on its head and uh, for people who do you use, use elasticsearch uh, if you don't want to store something right we are very used to storing is person uh, an ideal field right in sql and we set that to a false 
don't do that just let it not be there if it's not there you can use a missing filter on it it's just easier to do a set operation than a search operation which is a login operation right at best so use that so breaking that down for you uh, I think it's really important to understand what happens to your data when it goes in is you can define analyzers, right? You can define uh, filters and analyzers, and you can say turn every instance of ampersand into a uh, and, okay, into a and d, the characters. Or you could come up with something more complicated using Huntspell, where you would say translate the words if they are in German into English and store them that way. Now the user doesn't need to know that. The user is going to input a recipe in say German if I've translated that to English while inputting the data and then I look for recipes of a fish in my query they'll still hit the right documents right and you you can choose how to shard this data and you can have both the German and the English meanings there uh, you can get rid of stop words in most cases you don't need stop words like uh, and uh, all these words you you want to probably throw out and uh, another common use case is you build a system to scrape a lot of web pages and you want to get rid of all the HTML tags because that's spam. So that comes built in. So you actually put these together in a stream and that is how your data goes in. Now that seems pretty simple, right? That, that, that's doable in any other database. The interesting bit is you can apply the same filters and analyzers on a query. So even though you store data in a certain way, you can enable your query to be analyzed in a different way, which will then map to your data that you stored. So if a user typed in something in Italian, and you define a Huntspell translation over there, it would just work, right? So this gives you incredible control over what data actually hits your index. And this is something really amazing, right? So uh, let's get to the basic operations. What is inserting? And inserting would be as simple as that. You need not even have those indices created, right? So PyCon 14 would be the index here. Attendee would be your type. And one is the ID. And I send this as a put request over rest. And this would get stored. He'll figure out the types and it'll work, right? Now I've got an attendee in. Uh, similarly, any tweets about Bangalore, uh, you used an analyzer, figured out all hashtags map to tags, right? That's how you input your data. If you, dis if you define mappings on them earlier, the mappings will be applied. And if it finds a mismatch, it'll give an error. It'll throw back uh, 502 or whatever, right? So it's really that simple. And okay, uh, show of hands for how many of you have heard of Lucene or worked with the Lucene syntax, right? So the simplest form of search, which is why you got down to this database in the first case, is uh, to do queries, right? So the Lucene syntax looks something like this, where I say Q is my query string parameter, which is a Lucene query, and I say tags, Elasticsearch, and user D underscore sate. Uh, so it just it's a way of saying, give me all documents that have Elasticsearch and this user. And you could use and or minus, like that's the Lucene syntax. You can look up the link. Uh, so that's the simplest form of quick querying you could do on your browser. So all this time, you need not even uh, have any library set up. You're just interacting with it on your browser. Uh, this is ideally what a query would look like. It'll be, it could be longer. We have queries that are about 300 lines long to do certain stuff. And it gives you incredible power. So uh, just to give you an idea, uh, I'm not going to, I will explain this in a different way, right? So let's, uh, you saw a filter part here, right? So filtered query and I say range timestamp. And I just say now minus 20 minutes to now. So give me data in the last 20 minutes. And this is the first part of where we actually get to learning what filters are. Filters are a kind of way to say that I do not want to query this data. First filter the data set for me on this filter and then run a query on this filter. And the uh, idea of filters is they are incredibly fast. They're about 10x faster than queries. And uh, obviously they're Boolean only. If you want Boolean algebra can be done really quickly, right? So they're designed in a certain way that you don't really analyze them or query them. You just use Boolean logic there. And uh, they are scoped to your query and also uh, it has a very cool form of caching, right? So in most cases, what you would do is you would make a query, the cache would use a TTL, and it would be cleaned up. In Elasticsearch, it does it differently. Any document updates that happen after you've defined a filter, right? Even a bunch of AND filters are split up. 
and each filter gets updated automatically as documents change, right? So it's all cached in memory, which makes it really, really fast. And this is just an example to give you a geo distance. If you were trying to find all people talking about PyCon in a 100 kilometer radius of this latitude and longitude of where we are, uh, you would just run this filter. And that would automatically take tweets that have lat longs within a 100 kilometer radius. Coming to queries, queries can be quite detailed and they can be fuzzy. The default is the must. Must indicates that it must match something, right? It must match this pattern. Must not obviously is self-explanatory. And should means it should compulsorily match it. Must is still fuzzy. It need not really match it. So what really happens in this case is when your data comes out, it gets scored with a TF ID. There's something called TF-IDF that scores your document matching a query. And they are automatically scored according to how you write your query. So if you notice, uh, I'm running a multi-field match. I'm checking if the word Elasticsearch exists in either the tag or the message. I'm running this on a stream of tweets that are coming in, right? And I can give something called a query field boost on tags. That if someone has taken the pain to particularly tag Elasticsearch in his tweet, it's probably more relevant than someone talking about Elasticsearch randomly. So my query will automatically give it a 10x boost, and it'll show up on top, because search needs to be designed in, in a way that the results that are most relevant should show up on the top. How many, how many of you have ever gone to the second or third page of Google? Or anywhere beyond the fifth page? OK, I mean, well, very few. Obviously, you had a lot of time, right? Um, so there's something called fields, which is essentially like in SQL, you'd say select star, or you'd say select A or B. Uh, you know, your tuple tables where you can select fields. And uh, you can do a date desk you, that's basically s selecting a sort order. So you'll get them sorted by that, but they still have the score relevant sort remaining on them. So it's like uh, sorting inside buckets. Um, one more insane thing it does is highlighting. So when you do a Google search and you get a result that says, you know, this document matched, and you get a bunch of highlighted text telling you what that document is about. Now try implementing that by yourself in any other search database. And I can give you, a, well, I guarantee it'll be a pain. And here you can actually define how many words will show up in your result. And he'll give the highlighted term of why a certain document matched you, in what way. And he'll give you an analysis of how he did it, right? So it's that. Uh, one more thing they've done really well is suggestors, right? Now, in 80 to 90% of the cases where you are provided a search box, you know what the user is looking for. You're building a shopping website, or you're building a, a food, something like Zomato, right? When you start typing in TH, he's probably looking for Thai, or he's looking for shoes. Now, a lot of times, you don't really need to hit a query at all. You just need to autocomplete his query and infer what he's talking about. So what these guys have done is all your documents, when you put them in, you can say, that this is a type of string, and it suggests an auto-completion. You can define its payloads, and it'll automatically start suggesting for these inputs. If someone starts typing Nimhans, and he is on your page, and you're, you are has geek, right? Then you would start automatically going to PyCon India at this point, because that is what he's looking for, it's context. And these are basically built using uh, finite state transitions, so they're really quick. And you can have fuzziness in them, so even autocorrect works on them. So you really don't need to run searches. You will already have a cached result for stuff talking about PyCon. You shouldn't be running a search in that case. So this is something really, really cool. And uh, a tip out there, if your suggestor is taking more than one millisecond, then you're probably doing it wrong. Right? Uh, as I said, I'm going to not talk about using Elasticsearch in the conventional way. I'm going to be covering topics or lesser known topics that you would like to discover and use and what you could take away from them. So this is scripting, right? Uh, scripting is incredibly powerful. In, how many of you have scripted in Redis? You can write little Lua scripts in Redis. Now the idea that you can script a database is fairly impressive. In an ideal case, what you tend to do is you look for a record, you fetch your record, you update your record and you send an update request, correct? Uh, and especially this comes matters a lot in NoSQL because you don't have control over each row. Every time you update a document in most 
NoSQL databases, you actually just mark the old document for deletion and create a new document at the end of the index and then you merge it, which is fairly inefficient, but it's the way they are designed for very obvious other purposes. Right, so what you could do is you could use your documents as finite state machines and what we actually do, this is some, some of our production code that when we, when, when we see an action on a particular page inside our uh, infra that on the tool that I built, it automatically refers to the document that I'm dealing with and alters its fields and alters its stats without actually doing anything else and it guarantees atomicity for me. So even if I'm, this document is being updated at the rate of say 100 requests a second, it'll guarantee these atomic step changes through uh, going through that process. And that becomes really important when you're trying to keep track of thousands of servers, right? And uh, also it takes lower bandwidth. Obviously now you're just referring to a script. I call this on action. I'm referring to a script and I'm only passing the parameters that the script should execute. The script is already sitting on my database. So I don't need to get data and send data. It's just so much less work. It's just much easier. And you can write uh, scripts in a variety of languages. The current default is Mevil. In the next release that's coming out next month, it's going to change to something called Groovy. But you have modules that allow you to script in JavaScript, in Python, in uh, a bunch of other languages. Pure, plain Java too, if you want those kind of speeds. And the interesting part about scripting is you can actually write a script that will then be used on your query. So if you wanted to write a script that says, uh, run this particular thing that if the document contains these two words, and it's by this user update 10 more things and get me the result and run an aggregation on it. At query time, it'll happen. So you can refer to scripts in your thing. Uh, this is perhaps my favorite part, right? I ran a query uh, for, I ran a query over a stream. I revered Twitter's host pipe into my database. There's something called a river. I can river entire Wikipedia as it changes into my database and the database will do the pulling for me. And what I did here is I defined something called a split 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, I want a date histogram uh, based on the field time at an interval of 10 minutes. Well, I name my field that way. So this will take all the documents that entered and filter them in buckets of 10 minutes, right? Um, 10 minute buckets. The second aggregation I used on them was term tags. What that will do is for each bucket, he will build further buckets with every tag. Say you had tags of pizza, Python, you had uh, tags of Cabin Park or whatever else, he'll create tag buckets out of those. And then you can use, um, uh, if you scripted your mood, you scripted a little algorithm that told you about the mood of what he's talking about. You still have documents of his entire tweet. Is he happy when he's talking about pizza? Is he, is he enjoying the talk he's attending at PyCon, right? You, you'd write a little script and he would give you all those aggregations in buckets or, and you could actually graph them out using something like Angular or uh, D3.js and plot them on a timeline. There's something even more very interesting, right? If I got all these tags and uh, I use something called a top hits aggregation and I sub aggregated that with something called a geo grid, right? He would divide the world map into geo grids and you can define everything down from 1.6 centimeters to a 5,000 kilometer by a 5,000 kilometer box. And he would give you for each box, what are the trending phrases every 10 minutes. And you could zoom into a box and see how, uh, what people in a particular region are thinking when they tweet. Or uh, this is just an example of Twitter, right? So, and all this in one single query, right? We've got, uh, we, I just wrote a stats app last week for our, uh, graphing all our infrastructure. And I get data about every single response metric, every single way how people are interacting with the infra in a single query, in a single page, uh, in less than 0.6 seconds. So this is impossible with any other, I don't know of any other database you can do this with, perhaps solar, but that's about it. That's also, it's like a computer, right? Uh, this is something that's really, really, really unique, right? Now 90% of your use cases, what you are traditionally used to in a database is you store a lot of data and then you run queries on it. Simple enough. That is the idea we have of a database. But if truth be told, you really don't need to do that. In most cases, if, if I developed a mobile application that learned about me, I, say I was to develop Google now, and I, start, I want to start suggesting places around me 
food around me, uh, movies running in the mall next to me, right? You'll have a bunch of queries that you would run against each data entry you got. And now scale that up to a billion people. It, it won't really work. So what Elasticsearch has come up for this is something called percolators. In percolators, you store your queries. Okay, with a query ID, you store your queries. You do not store your data against a particular index. And then you run the, uh, the data point that you are going to enter into the database against the percolator. And all the percolators that match this document, right? Say I set a query that said match tags Elasticsearch, and I started shoving in uh, a lot of uh, tweets about, you know, from the global uh, hose. Every ma message that matches this uh, query will return something like this. It matches one query on index tweets one, which is exactly the percolator ID that I registered with this. So if I had a thousand or a million. There are people using million queries at a time, and they can be used for a trigger of alarms. Like, did this uh, stock price, suppose I have a way of entering stock price into my database. If stock price belonging to category pharma went up by 10 points in the last n minutes, then, well, uh, send, send an email to me, right? Now, that would be something really hard to do with the amount of data flowing in in a conventional stock market. Here, it would be really, really simple. So this is one of our favorite new things. We use it to tag events flowing into maintenance modes and stuff like that in our current architecture. That's percolation. Uh, obviously, it's PyCon. You must be wondering where the hell is all the Python. I've been talking about a database and rest all this time. Uh, in all honesty, there have been a bunch of iterations about how I would devise a client library for Python or for any language for that matter. I, I use a lot of Ruby these days with uh, the same Elasticsearch Ruby clients. So the idea is Elasticsearch is evolving extremely fast. They come out with a new release every two months, and the release is actually worth upgrading to. I mean, I'm actually waiting for the next release because I want some features, uh, some kind of new aggregators that they've built. So it's extremely fast. There is no v real way to map a DSL from Python into, into these uh, REST JSON queries. Even for Ruby, it's really hard when Ruby is actually much simpler to uh, frame DSLs in. So why should you use a Python library and not use... Uh, so finally they said, let's ditch this idea. Let's build a basic library that would take a hash or, uh, or a... Right, Python calls it a dict, right? So you would take a dict and you would enter that dict as your parameter and your basic stuff like uh, index could be mapped into this tuple, uh, named tuple, you would have doc types and IDs. So the idea is you get persistent connections. Now when you're building applications that do tens of thousands of queries every hour, you don't want to open a new TCP connection and you know send requests every time. So your libraries would have a connection pool manager, you would have load balancing between, you could fire uh, your queries remotely into any part of the cluster using a while string or a round, round robin or whatever logic you choose to use. Uh, you'll have thread safety. Uh, it'll be easy to integrate your models into Django or Flask or whatever you plan to use. Uh, also, error handling, right? If you were to do a REST request, it will give you a 502. Now, a 502 is not too useful. Uh, did my database fail? Was the query invalid? Uh, did the shard fail? Did I run out of memory? You know, what's the deal? So, these libraries have basic error handling and exception handling built in, which is super, super useful. You would just put a try accept loop around it. And uh, failed connections, right? So data, uh, connections to databases do fail. And you need to automatically retry. Now, what the Python library currently does, the official Elasticsearch Python library does, is puts all this work that you don't want to deal with. You're, you focus on building your application using this. But you use the same um, hash to send your queries across to the server. So that is probably the only reason you should be, and in fact, you definitely should not use REST to talk to the server and use a library if you're building a proper, respectable application. Uh, production gotchas, right? So we've been running it in production for a while now, and some of the problems I thought I'd share with you is firstly memory. It's, it's written in Java, and it's slightly dumb in its uh, design for memory. What it does is, in most databases, if you want to load data sets into memory, it first checks if I have enough. Elasticsearch does not check. It just tries to fill up memory and it goes OM, even if you have 48 GB of memory. So an ideal use case would be if you gave your Java VM 8 GB of memory, keep 8 GB spare, because he will uh, overwrite more into memory. And uh, it's, it's really simple to scale it across. You can score terabytes of data, just add more nodes. 
It's not really hard to do that. Uh, manual sharding, right? As I told you, it is a NoSQL database that writes and does not really update. So what we had to do in one of our use cases where we had, where we, we were actually using these state machines to toggle stuff, was we took a shard and put it in memory. And we named the shard with a different uh, suffix. And it automatically, you can query indices using just commas and wildcards in your query strings. So we, we could modify stuff in memory and RAM, well, you don't need to do segment merges. So it just works. Uh, networks, always create your applications so that they can deal with network errors because networks errors, network errors will happen. I mean, if you design applications with the assumption that everything will work, you're probably doing it wrong. Like, you have to assume it doesn't work, right? Uh, there's one, one concern that hasn't been solved in uh, Elasticsearch yet, which is a slight pain. It's called the split brain. We've thankfully not faced it to date. Uh, what it does is when you have a bunch of nodes in a cluster, then it auto-elects a master node where all the collection, so Elasticsearch essentially does internal map reduces. It, it, they call it scatter and gather. So you send a query, it scatters it to all shards and replicas and then gathers the results and compiles them back, right? So it needs some kind of coordination. It, I mean, it could happen on any node, but there has to be one master for at least writes. So there's a f uh, configuration option called minimum master nodes and a safe way to get past this at least, you know, 99% of the cases is keep this value as n by two plus one. If you have n nodes in your cluster, you should have, so if you have three nodes in your cluster, at least two should be up so that your cluster doesn't go down. In Elasticsearch, it's, it's designed to be run on cloud environments. So if I set up 100 nodes and I had enough nodes up, if, if I lost 20, I probably wouldn't be bothered if I had enough replicas. And you could just put them up and down as you please according to your Elastic needs and it would rebalance itself out. So that's something really amazing. Security-wise, it comes with basic HTTP auth. Uh, as Kiran was telling you about, but um, you usually never expose your database to the outer world, right? Uh, easy way of getting around this is use a proxy. There's something called ES proxy. It's a Node.js application, which can plug into any uh, authentication system. And the best part about this is you have an Elasticsearch JS library that you put in your web browser, and you're actually talking to your database uh, through JavaScript code using jQuery which is pretty insane. You uh, try, try doing that with other databases with as much ease. And uh, yeah, your client should be uh, designed to handle failure. Like nodes might go down and up. It should retry to another node and it's not really hard to do that. So that's about it. And finally is the Elk stack, which is probably the most popular use case of Elasticsearch today, is you just, you take something like a Kafka broker, put all your logs, uh, use lo uh, log stash and just chuck like loads and loads and loads of logs, like millions of billions of entries we chuck into our Elasticsearch clusters every day. And you could run analysis on them. You could find out who's calling from where, who's doing what, what server had what kind of issues, what was the CPU history, what was in essentially anything. You could use it for Facebook. You could use it for tweets, as I was giving an example. And I think you should go home and check out this database. It has some kick-ass features that you probably want to try. I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. What is the difference between MongoDB and Elasticsearch then? Uh, it provides very, all the features. Very different. I mean, they have all the features like aggregation, text search, geo special indexes. Yeah, so, well. Uh, aggregations are not really the same. In MongoDB, your aggregations, you actually write your map and reduce functions, right? No, they have aggregator. Okay. Uh, percolators, do you have percolators in Mongo? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a new technology, I liked it. I mean, Mongo wasn't really working. I mean, yeah, as I told you, you're going to start these database wars where you'll say, hey, my database is better. Um, so the idea was to introduce you to a new one, which really works well. Yeah. We have one more question. And you don't have Lucene and um, uh, try, okay. If you were to build a chat app that had to do a lot of search across thousand users. So the use case of uh, wait, HipChat, right? So HipChat used, uh, if you want to run full text search on all your logs 
and obviously the thousands of millions of users. And now what you would do is put your data into MongoDB and uh, there's no real way to search through all these documents in a really quick time in Mongo, right? So what they did as an implementation was they put Redis in front of it, used Mongo Redis connectors and ran Lucene on top of it. And they took some, and they reduced their footprint by uh, order of magnitude when they shifted to Elasticsearch. So that's the area. Is there a standard way to back up? Yeah, it's, that is a very good question. Once again, yeah. Uh, is there a standard way to back up Elasticsearch DB? Yes, uh, in the 1.x release, you can snapshot, you can back up. It works really well. Does it, uh, the backup need to run all the nodes or one of the, the nodes? Uh, so, in, uh, firstly, in Elasticsearch, you really never need to back up your data. I mean, okay, that's probably not true, but um, it's perfectly cool to lose a bunch of nodes in your cluster. It's designed to lose a bunch of nodes. Right, so in most cases, your replication acts as your backup. But if you do want to do snapshotting backups, uh, there's a plugin called, uh, uh, well, there is a, I'm not sure what it's called, but we, we ran custom scripts because we started before 1x. So you could just backup your entire data there using a cron job, it's that simple. And it would work. Uh, Elasticsearch and Solar, right? So Solar is really good, but, well, there are certain things Elasticsearch is better at it's especially its aggregations, percolations. Uh, also, the redundancy and stuff is slightly better. Well, you could use either, to be honest. But I just like the DSL of Elasticsearch more. You could use Solar. So uh, there's a very good document on this on why Wikipedia moved away from Solar to Elasticsearch. Maybe they'll give you a better idea. Yeah. Okay, one, one announcement. Please submit the feedback forms at the registration desk. Okay? Yes. So ideally your logs are, uh, have you seen a syslog ng or log stash? Right, so by default what you would do is you would put it in a specific format and uh, into a JSON object and send a put request. And that should map. If you have the mappings, he'll enforce the type criteria on them, like float or int or whatever else. If you don't have type criteria, he'll assume it's a string and he'll store them and you can still query them, but you would lose stuff, right? So if I ended up storing uh, an ISO 8061 timestamp uh, as a string because I would not declared it as a string, for some reason you missed up a Z, you missed your TZ data, then you probably might infer it to be a string and then you can't run time range aggregations on it. So. Uh, it'll be a good idea to set your schemas. I mean, even though it's not necessary. <laughs> uh, go to a wh what OS to use? What 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 distribution do you use? Fedora. Just uh, add the repository. Yum install Elasticsearch. Hit your port 9200. You'll get started. It's, it's really that simple. Do we have the support? Do we have the support to configure the indexing relevance? Sorry. Uh, uh, let's say yeah. in a in a document, uh, I want to uh, index the words in the first para with uh. higher relevance, and in and index the words in the second para with the lower relevance, so that I can define the order of the results being returned. So what you would ideally do is uh, that would take place during an analysis phase where you would split up the paragraph and you would uh, index para one as para one, and in your mapping, what you would say is copy para one to total uh, corpus. Right, so you'll have a copy in para one, you'll have a copy in corpus. So you can actually return either one of them as you as you please. And uh, the thing to remember about Elasticsearch mappings is they are dynamic. Uh, they're not dynamic, sorry. Once they are set, you cannot change them. You have to re-index your entire database. You can add mappings, but you cannot remove or change them. So using this, I can change the relevance of the each, each uh, words. Yes, you can. So uh, one more thing that Elasticsearch does is smaller words get a higher score. Because smaller words are generally more important than larger words. I don't know, but... No TF-IDF comes into picture here. Huh? No TF-IDF comes into TF-IDF, of course. You can tweak the scoring algorithm. It's based in... You have five or six uh, things. You have Bayesian filters. You have Bloom filters. You have uh, TF-IDF. You can select that. <laughs> you can totally select your scoring logic. You can write a custom scoring logic. So that... We've, we've done that in one place. We've written a custom scoring logic. So. Yeah. Uh, can we expect the same kind of throughput or is there any difference in terms of indexing speed? Um, 
So I'll be honest with you, I've not really used Solar, right? But from what benchmarks suggest, it's pretty much similar. But it is done by Lucene at the end of the day. But those kind of things like filters, percolators, the level of analyzers, the number of tool sets you get for it, uh, Marvel, their monitoring dashboard called Marvel, uh, the plugins available for it, I think uh, Elasticsearch wins in, in those fields. It should be very similar. I, I, to be honest, I'm not really used Solar, so I think you should probably Google it. So yeah. Sorry? Query? Parsers, like Solar does. Uh, like? Solar has a query syntax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, it uses a query parser for. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, it uses various kind of parsers. Like, like, like. A dismax and dismax. So, uh, oh, yes, dismax and dismax, yeah. They are all basically mapping to your Lucene parameters, right? Okay. So, yeah, those are supported. I mean, I couldn't go into those details. It's really large. But you have a lot of configuration possibilities. And you have access to raw Java data types and all that. So, so can you give clarity to the text which you are passing in the query? Like, if I want some text to be passed above some uh, Can you give me an example? <laughs> for example, uh, in Flipkart, if I'm searching for a headphone, and yeah. if I want, uh, if I've gone through laptop to headphones as yeah. a category, I want laptop headphones to be rank higher. In a way, all 3.5 mm jacks. Oh uh, yeah. Own. So I yeah. don't think that will be handled by your database because uh, how there's no real way for your database to know what the user was right uh, your architecture would internally then do a query on your database yeah i can prioritize the text that yes yes you can give it a boost you can give it you can give a query boost you can give a term a query boost you can do that yeah thank you thank you thank you janaj for the yeah. wonderful talk on elastic now we'll have a 15 minutes break and get a assemble back here for a